Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on disability civil rights, the basics. This webinar is being captioned, so if you need that to participate, please visit the link included in your registration reminder. Also, this webinar is being recorded and following today's presentation will be posted on the PVA website and shared with registrants. I think there should be a slide uh, listing the link uh, for captioning. There it is. Um, if, if you have any questions during the presentation, please click on the Q&A control on your screen and post your question. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Now to introductions. I'm Susan Prokop, National Advocacy Director for Paralyzed Veterans of America and one of your presenters today. I'm going to be joined by my colleagues, Heather Ansley, Associate Executive Director for Government Relations at PVA, and Lee Page, Senior Associate Advocacy Director at PVA. Next slide. So our webinar today has a rather full agenda. We're gonna give you some very brief information about Paralyzed Veterans of America and then segue quickly into a fairly broad review of the major disability civil rights laws affecting most Americans with disabilities. You've likely heard about the Americans with Disabilities Act and we'll certainly be covering that major disability civil rights law. But first, we'll start with the oldest law, the Architectural and Transportation Barriers Act, continue with a discussion of the Rehabilitation Act, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Fair Housing Act Amendments, Air Carrier Access Act, and finish up with the Americans with Disabilities Act with a brief shout out to an important uh, set of voting rights laws that affect people with disabilities and some state and local disability rights laws. Next slide. Paralyzed Veterans of America was founded in 1946 as a congressionally chartered veteran service organization dedicated to advocating on behalf of veterans with spinal cord injuries or disorders. Over the decades, PVA has developed a unique expertise on a wide variety of issues, including promotion of high quality health care for our members, supporting research and education addressing spinal cord injury and disorders, preserving and strengthening benefits available to our members as a result of their military service, and supporting civil rights and opportunities that maximize the independence of our members and all people with disabilities. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lee for the first of our laws. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, Architectural Barriers Act, the ABA. Uh, the ABA, as you know, passed uh, in 1968. It was basically the first law that dealt with persons with disabilities. Uh, the, the Congress uh, passed it, said first federal measure to call for access for persons with disabilities. The law basically requires that buildings designed, built, or altered with federal dollars or leased by federal agencies after August of 1968 had to be accessible. This uh, covered uh, certain buildings, which included the United States Post Office, uh, the Veterans Affairs buildings, the medical facilities, the national parks, uh, the Social Security Administration's offices, uh, federal office or government buildings, uh, United States courthouses and federal prisons, uh, the federal prison system. Um, it also applies to non-government facilities that have received federal funding, such as certain schools and public housing, uh, 
and um, public housing under HUD, and then mass transit systems agencies also. Um, the ABA is enforced through the, through the Uniform Federal Accessible Standards or UFAS standards for design. Uh, the UFAS standards uh, basically are uh, accessible design standards which uh, basically give you these dimensions for uh, standards to indicate what ramps, parking lots, doors, elevators, listing uh, restrooms, fire alarms, all these type of uh, things that need to be made accessible inside uh, a building were designed in the UFAS standards back in 1968. UFAS is the precursor for the ADA standards, which were the ADAG standards, which were done in 1990. If you uh, encounter barriers in facilities that were funded, uh, federally funded, uh, you can file for um, you can file a complaint with the access board uh, for the for the, under the ABA. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next law was the Rehab Act or the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, it requires uh, access programs and activities that are funded for federal agencies and federal employment. So basically, uh, like Section 501 says that um, it requires affirmative action and non-discrimination in employment for people with disabilities uh, by the federal agencies. Um, Section 503 requires affirmative action and prohibits discrimination in employment for people with disabilities by the federal government in their contractors and their subcontractors. That's 503. Section 502 establishes the access board. Section 504 says, quote, no qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall be excluded from denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity that either receives federal financial assistance or is conducted by an executive agency or the United States Postal Service. That language uh, is basically the uh, exact language that we took from 504 and implemented that into the ADA. Uh, as, as the Rehab Act prevents discrimination in federal, in buildings and in other entities that receive federal funds, we took that language from 504 to be the basis of the ADA, which takes the same uh, premises of non-discrimination into the public accommodation sector uh, in the private sector also. Uh, later amendments to the Rehab Act were Section 508, which talks about coverage for access to electronic information technology, uh, technology information, which includes um, telephones and, and technology, uh, stuff like that. And then you've got uh, Later on, Section 510, which was passed during the Affordable Care Act, which looks at uh, diagnostic equipment for medical, uh, medical diagnostic equipment, which means the, uh, uh, anything in a doctor's office or a hospital that, uh, would be, that needs to be accessible for persons with disabilities to uh, gain access in those offices. Uh, next slide. Uh, afterwards, you have the U.S. Access Board. As I mentioned, uh, Access Board was created by Section 502 of the Rehab Act. Uh, one of the reasons being is that Congress recognized the fact that the 1968 ABA law was passed, and yet the covered entities really weren't in compliance, and that was because there was not uh, uh, uniform compliance, and that was because there was no real design standards at the had not been created. And so the Access Board was the ones that developed those UFAS standards. The Access Board is an independent federal agency that promotes equality for people with disabilities through leadership and accessible design and the development of accessible guidelines and standards. It was created in 1973 to ensure access to the federally funded facilities. The board is now the leading source of information on accessible design 
and the board develops and maintains design criteria for the built environment, uh, transit vehicles, telecommunication equipment, and as I said, medical diagnostic equipment. You know, the built environment uh, access board wrote all the regulations under the ADA for titles uh, two and three, which are public services and public accommodations. So all those built in, uh, you know, all those, uh, the ADAG design guidelines that cover the public accommodations. And then for the mass transit uh, regulations also under Title II for, uh, you know, city, uh, city subway systems and city bus systems and over the road coach such as Greyhound and Amtrak and heavy rail. All those guidelines were written by uh, the access board. So, um, next slide. Uh, some resources in, in, for the enforcement of the ABA and the Rehab Act. Uh, there again, if you look at these uh, uh, links below, you've got the Access Board link right there, www.accessboard.gov. Uh, the Access Board has public meetings. They have a, a very active website. All their meetings are on their website and they're open to the public. Uh, they're also listed in the, in the Federal Register. They do webinars on a regular basis uh, about accessible issues that come before the board. Uh, the board members are all presidential appointees and uh, the board governs what the access, uh, the board members govern the direction of the board and how it works. It's a small federal agency, but it packs a lot of punch in reference to what they accomplish and how it affects all persons with disabilities um, you know, in compliance with all disability laws across the country. Um, if you've got a complaint for the ABA, the Architectural Barrier Awareness, the ABA, you can file that at the Access Board also at, um, at, at that link right there. And then if you've got uh, employment discrimination under Section 501 or 503, you see that link at eeoc.gov. And those are... Um, uh, that's for filing for employment discrimination. And then you've got the um, Section 504 regulations. Each agency writes their own rules and regs for 504, and they also have an enforcement mechanism under each agency. Uh, back to you, uh, Susan. All right. Well, the next law we're going to talk about is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA for short. Formally, when it was first passed in 1975, it was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. And this law requires public schools to make available to all eligible children with disabilities a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment appropriate to their individual needs. IDEA requires public school systems to develop appropriate individualized education programs or IEPs for each child. The specific special education and related services outlined in each IEP are supposed to reflect the individualized needs of each student. Next slide. So the Office of Civil Rights in the US Department of Education is the office tasked with enforcing Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, as well as Title II of the ADA, which extended the Rehab Act prohibition against discrimination to the full range of state and local government services, programs, and activities, including public schools, regardless whether they received any federal financial assistance. While IDEA could technically be enforced through the Office of Civil Rights, the Education Department has turned that over to the states. Thus, for families encountering problems with education plans under IDEA, they should turn to their State Education Department's Special Education Office. There is also a Parent Training and Information Center in every state which is funded to help parents navigate this system. The website for this is there on the slide at parentcenterhub.org. Uh, 
and there's a protection and advocacy program in every state which can represent families when necessary. You can find a protection and advocacy office in your community at ndrn.org. On the next slide, we're going to turn to the Fair Housing Act amendments. The Fair Housing Act amendments were passed in 1988 and they added prohibitions against housing discrimination on the basis of disability and familial status to the other protected classes under the existing statute. These protections apply in most private multifamily housing, state and local government housing, public housing, and any other federally assisted housing programs and activities. Housing built for first occupancy after March 1991, regardless of whether it is for sale or as a rental, must meet the design and construction requirements of the Fair Housing Act. The Act requires owners of housing facilities to make reasonable exceptions in their policies and operations to afford people with disabilities equal housing opportunities. For example, a landlord with a no pets policy may be required to grant an exception to this rule and allow an individual with a disability to keep an assistance animal or an emotional support animal in their residence. The law also requires landlords to allow tenants with disabilities at their own expense to make reasonable access related modifications to their private living space, as well as to common use spaces. The next slide provides some uh, re resources and enforcement information about the Fair Housing Act for questions about the accessibility provisions of the law answers to technical guidance questions, more information or assistance on how to comply with the Act, a good website is Fair Housing First. That's the first one listed there. You can learn about the uh, seven design and construction requirements of the Fair Housing Act amendments, what housing the law applies to, and other useful information about the law. There is also the HUD Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, whose website is listed there. You can also file a complaint online, also at uh, HUD's Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Office. And then information about uh, assistance animals covered by the Fair Housing Act and HUD funded programs can be found at the listed link on the HUD archives. And from here, we go on to the Air Carrier Access Act. Thank you, Susan. The passage of the Air Carrier Access Act in 1986 broadly established the civil right of people with disabilities to access air travel. Prior to passage of the ACAA, people with disabilities were routinely forced to travel with an attendant at their own expense, whether they needed the assistance of an attendant or not, required to sit on a blanket for fears that they might soil the seat or simply refused passage. The ACAA has improved passengers with disabilities uh, ability to travel with uh, improved consistency and improved access. Through this law, passengers with disabilities are provided the opportunity to pre-board if additional time or assistance is required in boarding the aircraft, timely assistance in boarding and deplaning from trained air carrier and contract personnel, access to accessible in-flight communication, stowage of their assistive devices, and help with seating accommodation. It's important to remember that the law we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, the Air Americans with Disabilities Act does not govern access to air travel for people with disabilities. The Air Carrier Access Act is the only law, uh, disability civil rights law, uh, that explicitly uh, applies to each and every airline, both uh, foreign and domestic. As part of the requirements uh, that, the, that the airlines are to assist passengers with disabilities, they must, as I said, provide guide assistance uh, for any passengers who need that uh, help in assisting them to their gate. Uh, this could include stopping by a restroom uh, if that was requested. Um, and assistance must also be given to ensure that passengers with disabilities are able to make 
uh, connecting flights as needed. And this assistance uh, may be uh, provided directly by your airline or by a contract service provider um, who provides that type of assistance. Um, airlines must also provide individuals who request additional time to pre-board, um, and they also must provide prompt assistance at the request of the individual uh, with any help that they might need um, in boarding or uh, when you arrive at your destination, deplaning the aircraft. This could uh, include uh, providing you with an aisle chair, which is a, a boarding wheelchair designed to help a person who uses a wheelchair full time to get onto the aircraft, um, on board wheelchairs once on the aircraft to be able to access um, a lavatory, um, and then uh, other uh, making sure that there are ramps to access the airplane, a lift, uh, all those types of things that help individuals to get on and off the aircraft. The ACAA also requires uh, airlines to provide passengers uh, with a seat that meets their disability-related needs, uh, but it has to be within the class of service of the ticket uh, that was purchased. So, for instance, if you were to purchase a, a coach ticket um, to fly uh, to some uh, destination, the airline would have to accommodate you at no additional cost uh, within the coach cabin. So for instance, they could not charge you extra to, to set on an aisle seat if you needed an aisle seat um, to accommodate your disability. However, they do not have to accommodate you within a different class of service. So for instance, if you have that coach uh, seat uh, ticket, you are, they do not have to provide you with a first class seat or a class uh, or a seat in uh, perhaps the business uh, section of the airplane. The Air Carrier Access Act also does provide um, access for service animals. Uh, specifically, uh, a service animal under this particular law is uh, any animal that is individually trained or able to provide assistance to a qualified person with a disability or any animal that is shown by documentation to be necessary for the emotional well-being of a passenger. Thus, cats and other animals may be considered service animals for Air Carrier Access Act purposes. Uh, for foreign carriers, they only have to carry dogs. It's also important to note that despite what you may have seen in the media, airlines are never required to uh, carry uh, snakes or other unusual types of animals as emotional support or service animals. In addition, airlines are required to allow a passenger with a disability to stow a manual wheelchair, canes, crutches, walkers, or other similar devices in the aircraft cabin. There are no baggage limits for assistive devices. If the aircraft cabin has a closet, then a wheelchair or other uh, assistive devices must have priority access to that cabin over even the crew or other passengers items um, if they are also boarding the aircraft. Uh, wheelchairs may also be, uh, a manual wheelchair may also be uh, seat strapped in the cabin. Uh, one uh, has to be allowed and up to two wheelchairs may be seat strapped in the cabin if the second wheelchair will not displace a passenger. It's also important to remember that if an assisted device um, is damaged uh, during the air travel process, that the normal baggage claim limits do not apply. The airline is required uh, to uh, fix the damage um, and to return your wheelchair uh, to the state in which uh, you uh, provided it to them uh, when you left for the travel. Although access for passengers with disabilities has improved since the passage of uh, this particular law, uh, disability-related problems uh, remain. Uh, for example, many members of Paralyzed Veterans of America routinely incur bodily harm in the boarding and deplaning process. Uh, their wheelchairs, particularly power wheelchairs, are often damaged while stowed. In addition, uh, our members have expressed difficulty in receiving uh, appropriate seating accommodations and just often encounter air carrier personnel and their contractors 
who are not appropriately trained in how to assist passengers with disabilities, particularly with those who may have catastrophic disabilities. Unfortunately, that means some of our members and other individuals with disabilities choose to drive long distances rather than to risk uh, any injury or damage to their mobility device. If you do uh, fly and you encounter uh, some type of discrimination under the Air Carrier Access Act, you have a couple of options uh, as far as trying to, uh, to get a remedy. So first, you can file a complaint directly with your airline. Um, you know, for instance, if you had damage to your wheelchair, you would report that to them and then they would work with you uh, to uh, get your chair fixed, possibly even providing you with a loaner chair um, if needed. The airlines all have uh, contractors that they work with to provide their wheelchair um, uh, repair assistance. Uh, you may also, if you file a complaint directly with the airline, they may decide to rebate uh, some of the cost of your ticket or to provide you with uh, miles that could be used toward a future trip. Uh, it is also um, the ability of a passenger with a disability who has a complaint under the air carrier to file that complaint directly with the U.S. Department of Transportation, and those complaints can be filed online. Under the second bullet, you'll see a um, a, a web link to uh, be able to uh, uh, click on. You can provide uh, your complaint directly. Uh, complaints are then referred uh, to the airline for response. The Department of Transportation uh, reviews those uh, responses and takes additional action as needed. They can levy civil penalties um, against the airlines for violations of the law. Uh, unfortunately, they most often do that only in situations involving uh, patterns of practice of problems, so multiple individuals experiencing a particular problem. Uh, if the department finds that they, your air carrier access rights have been violated, um, there is no uh, monetary compensation um, that you are able to receive. It is simply um, a notification to the airline that they have violated um, the law. Unlike many other civil rights laws, including many disability civil rights laws, there's no express right to uh, file a lawsuit um, in court alleging that your rights were violated, that you were discriminated against. Um, and so for many people, uh, it's difficult to, to find a way to get their, uh, their grievances addressed. Uh, the final bullet, the fourth bullet on the slide, does include a link to um, the Department of Transportation's website. Um, and if you uh, click on that, you will see that there are uh, all of the information with their, their guidelines, regulations, uh, all kinds of information about air travel. And I will uh, take this moment just to note that this webinar is being, uh, once again, is being recorded um, and will be available um, in the future on PVA's um, website, pva.org. Um, so you'll have the opportunity to take a closer look at um, all the links that we've discussed at that time. We're now going to switch to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we have uh, referenced this law many times. Um, and on uh, July 26, 1990, uh, so nearly 29 years ago, uh, President George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law. The ADA is a comprehensive uh, civil rights law that prohibits discrimination in employment, uh, public services, public accommodations, and telecommunication. And the promise of the ADA was encapsulated in President Bush's statement as he prepared to sign this historic civil rights legislation, and that was to let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. So who is covered under the ADA? Well, the ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. This also includes people who have a record of such an impairment, even if they do not currently have a disability. An example of such an individual might be someone who had cancer, um, whose cancer has, uh, is now subsequently in, in remission. Um, it also includes individuals who do not have a disability but are regarding as having a disability. 
Again, an example of that may be um, a veteran who served in a combat zone um, and a future employer um, assumes that because of the veteran's military service that he or she um, is living with post-traumatic stress disorder. That would be an example of regarding someone as having a disability. The uh, protections also extend uh, to individuals who may have a relationship with a covered person with a disability or an association with an individual with a disability. Now, the ADA's definition of disability was amended in 2008 by the ADA Amendments Act. And Congress passed this law in response to some Supreme Court decisions that had narrowly interpreted the ADA's definition of disability. So the ADA made a number of significant changes uh, to the definition of disability to ensure that it would be easier uh, for people who were seeking the protections of the ADA to establish that they have a disability that falls within the meaning of the statute. So what does the ADA address? The ADA includes five titles, employment, state and local pu governments, public accommodations and services operated by private entities, telecommunication, and then provisions that relate to the ADA as a whole. We'll now look at the first title of the ADA. The first title addresses access to employment. So prior to 1990, there was no widespread prohibition against discriminating against people with disabilities. And the purpose of this title was to ensure that people with disabilities have access to the same employment opportunities as other Americans. It applies to private employers, state and local employers, employment agencies and labor unions that have 15 or more employees. In addition to prohibiting employment discrimination, Title I also requires that covered employers provide reasonable accommodations to assist an applicant and employees with disabilities unless to do so would cause an employer an undue burden or in other words, would be too difficult or expensive. The employment protections available under the ADA also limit medical examinations and the types of inquiries that employers can make of their applicants and employees. Title II covers access to public services provided by state and local governments, their departments, agencies, or other instrumentalities. Under Title II, public entities may not prohibit a person with a disability to participate in a service or a program or some type of activity simply because the person has a disability. The programs and services must be offered in an integrated setting unless differences are needed to ensure equal opportunity. Entities must also eliminate unnecessary eligibility standards or rules that deny an equal opportunity to enjoy uh, the services or programs unless that would be necessary for uh, the provision of the service. In addition, uh, reasonable mod modifications to policies, practices, and procedures must also be made unless to do so would somehow fundamentally alter them. Entities cannot charge special fees uh, to cover measures that are needed to ensure non-discrimination. They also must furnish auxiliary aids and services that may be needed to ensure that effective communication um, is available to participants. Newly constructed buildings must be free of architectural and communication barriers. And if an existing building is altered, then the portion of that building that was altered must be made accessible. Under Title III, we have an assurance of access to public accommodations and services. So a public accommodation is a restaurant, hotel, theater, grocery store, dry cleaner, doctor's office, daycare, the list goes on and on. The places that we all traditionally go um, in our everyday lives in our community. It is important to note, however, that it does not cover places of worship or other entities that may be controlled by um, religious organizations. So public accommodations must provide their goods and services in an integrated setting, unless there is some difference that would be needed to ensure an equal opportunity. Uh, they must also eliminate unnecessary eligibility standards or rules that would deny the opportunity to enjoy the service. Uh, again, unless that would be necessary for the provision of the service. 
Uh, reasonable modifications in policies, practices, and procedures must be made. Uh, uh, public accommodations must also furnish those auxiliary aids and services needed to ensure the effective communication. Um, again, unless there would, that would uh, cause this undue burden or fundamental alteration. Uh, public accommodations are also responsible for removing any architectural barriers um, and structural communication barriers that may be in their existing facilities um, where it is cheap and easy for them to do so. They uh, also must design and construct new facilities, um, and when undertaking alterations, um, they must alter facilities in accommodation uh, with standards that were developed uh, by the U.S. Access Board and then subsequently adopted uh, by the Department of Justice. Title IV addresses telephone and television access for people um, with uh, who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing or have speech uh, disabilities. It requires uh, telephone companies and other common carriers to establish um, interstate and intrastate telecommunications relay services that, that go 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And those relay services enable callers um, who are deaf or hard of hearing or have speech disabilities um, to be able to uh, communicate with callers who use uh, voice telephone by using a third party uh, to help uh, the two individuals to communicate. And the Federal Communications Commission has set minimum standards for those services. Uh, Title IV also requires closed captioning of any federally funded public service announcement. I'll lastly mention the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996, which is not part of the ADA, um, but does also uh, impact communications in that it requires manufacturers of telecommunications equipment and providers of those services to ensure that their equipment and services are accessible to and usable by uh, people with disabilities. And that ensures uh, that people with disabilities have access to telephones, uh, cell phones, operator services, um, any other type of telecommunication service that we all might use on a daily basis. And the Federal Communications uh, Commission is charged uh, with that enforcement. So I'm now going to hand it uh, back to uh, Lee, who is going to talk with us about uh, resources and enforcement of the ADA. Uh, great. Thanks, Heather. Um, Yes, enforcement and resources, as you see on the slide. Department of Justice uh, is the main agency that does enforcement for the Americans with Disabilities Act, Titles 2 II and 3. You can look at the website, www.ada.gov. That is a great uh, information website, which you can, has a great search engine. You can type in any question and find out basically any type of information you need to know about the ADA, how to comply with the ADA, um, or where to search for more information on the ADA. Um, below it, you see is another um, ADA.gov website that deals with service animals and frequently asked questions for service animals. Another great uh, resource is the guide to disability rights laws, which is another sub web page under ADA.gov. And then finally, another great resource is the ADA National Network, access to 10 regional networks across the country. Um, this is a great resource, especially if you're out advocating uh, Title III compliance for public accommodations. Uh, the ADA networks can provide you with a wealth of information in um, brochures uh, that, and guides that you can hand out to businesses and refer to them and how to come into compliance with the law. And then the uh, ADA uh, National Network also does an annual conference of education on ADA and all the new, uh, new things that are going on with the ADA. And then also they will come and do training in, in local areas where all uh, people can participate, uh, including businesses that are trying to seek out information to comply. Um, you see below uh, the EEOC, which covers Title I, 
If you feel like charges of employment discrimination uh, based on disability, you can file um, a complaint with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in their field offices. Field offices are located in 50 cities throughout the country. So if you go to the EEOC.gov website, they will load that they will give you the location of those um, field offices to file, file those uh, complaints. And then also below is the Department of Transportation, which covers Title II, which is the um, mass transit provisions of the uh, Title II of the ADA. And you can go to uh, dot.gov, the Office of Civil Rights and Federal Transit Agencies. Those are for questions and complaints in reference to public transportation. Uh, the Office of Civil Rights, basically. So if it's uh, subways or um, or city buses um, or those type of mass transit, paratransit issues, you can uh, file a complaint at that website there. Uh, next slide. Okay, well, let's look at some other uh, issues. Uh, voting right laws, as you know, uh, Voting, uh, everyone is guaranteed the right to vote in this country by the Constitution of the United States. Uh, voting rights also pertain to people with disabilities, um, and they go back as far as 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which allowed a voter with a disability to receive assistance from a person of his, cho his or her choice at the polling place to ensure, uh, so that person who needs uh, who would need assistance could have that assistance in at the registration table or in the polling booth or actually marking the ballot. Uh, the Voting Accessibility and Elderly Handicap Act of 1984 requires polling places to be accessible during federal elections for elderly and handicapped individuals. Um, and if the polling place is not accessible, then uh, the polling place must provide alternate alternative means to casting the ballot. Um, it, in this time, this is where uh, what we kind of say move it or lose it. Polling places are, you know, decided by local jurisdictions and uh, this law required them to make the polling places accessible. If it was not accessible, if, if it was not accessible, they had to seek other facilities within that jurisdiction and move that polling place to an accessible facility. If they could not find an accessible facility within that jurisdiction, they were allowed to do alternative means, which in that time meant curbside voting, which would mean they would bring the ballot to you outside of the facility. Uh, Title II of the ADA uh, requires state and local governments to ensure that people with disabilities have full and equal opportunity to vote. That's all aspects of voting. ADA provisions apply for all aspects, including registration, site selection, casting the ballot, a path of travel, which includes parking, the entrance, registration table, in the, in the, in the polling booth, and casting the ballot. In 1993, the National Voter Registration Act passed, also known as Motor Voter. That law requires all division, DMV, uh, Division of Motor Vehicles to provide voter registration opportunities when you get your driver's license, but it also requires states to offer voter registration opportunities at all offices that provide public assistance and all offices that provide state-funded programs primarily engaged in providing services to people with disabilities. Um, and then uh, in 2002, you've got the Help America Vote Act, or known as HAVA, which requires jurisdictions to provide at least one accessible voting system for people with disabilities at each polling place in federal elections. Accessible voting systems must provide the same opportunities to access and participate, including privacy and independence as, as other voters receive. Uh, the reason this is so important was because the HAVA law was all about electronic voting it established the Election Assistance Commission, which governs electronic voting and sets the rules and regulations for electronic voting machines. And so we had to completely ensure that we had equal access for privacy uh, and independent voting under the Help America Vote Act law. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
And so um, enforcement in reference to voting rights, you can go to ADA.gov voting checklist. This is where, uh, this is also part of the ADA. It's a great uh, resource. It's a guidelines of an accessible polling place. Uh, this was, uh, this uh, was designed by the access board. It's basically a path of travel of how to walk through a polling place and uh, identify barriers. And then uh, it's a guide for polling, uh, polling place officials to make sure the polling place is accessible. Also uh, below that, you see uh, the voting rights section under the Department of Justice. That's where you would file a complaint if you felt like you had uh, been discriminated in under the motor voter law, basically in during registration practices or under the Help America Vote Act law if uh, electronic voting um, had a problem, if you had problems accessing the poll there. And as I mentioned, the EAC, uh, EAC.gov is the uh, commission that uh, governs the accessible voting machines and they write the rules for that. And, um, and so if there's a problem with that, you can also look back on that website for um, more information there also. Uh, Heather, back to you. Thanks, Lee. We're gonna talk briefly um, about state and local uh, disability rights laws that may exist. So a number of states um, have disability rights laws that are uh, similar or companions to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, these state laws uh, can be uh, broader in the protections that are provided to people with disabilities beyond those in the, the ADA. Um, an example of that broader protection uh, might include access to public accommodations, uh, those hotels, restaurants, grocery stores, uh, for uh, emotional support animals, which do not have access under the Americans with Disabilities Act, or for non-canine species such as cats. So the, the state law or the, the local law could, could be more generous, if you will, in the uh, protections that are available go above and beyond that of the ADA. Those uh, state laws uh, may also provide greater remedies if you encounter discrimination, including monetary compensation. So for example, Title III of the ADA uh, does not provide for monetary damages. So if you encounter discrimination um, at a doctor's office, um, you could, uh, for instance, file a lawsuit in, in court, uh, but your only uh, remedy would be for uh, for what they call injunctive relief, and that basically would remain, remove the barrier, stop the practice that you're doing, but there's no monetary uh, damages that you can get. But some state laws, however, do provide damages. And if that was the case, then you could file um, a, a complaint, for instance, in court, um, alleging that your rights were violated both under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the state law, and the violation of the state law would allow for the damages that the ADA does not. Um, it's important to remember also that if the protections that are provided under the state law or are less than those granted under the ADA, then the ADA uh, trumps that state law. So a state law um, that uh, has, has fewer protections than those granted under the ADA uh, you, you don't have to be concerned about that because the ADA would come in and be the standard um, that's available. So it's, it's the floor uh, of what has to be provided. And then the states can go above that if they choose to, but they can't go below that. It's also important to remember that some uh, local jurisdictions, so cities or counties, they may have uh, human rights laws, human rights commissions, other civil rights laws, uh, and they may, pro may provide protections based uh, to, to a number of, of individuals based on, uh, for instance, disability. So uh, if you encounter some type of disability discrimination, it's possible that you may be able to get assistance, um, not just at the federal law, but also um, at that state or local level. Lastly, we wanted to talk a little bit about how to get help with uh, disability rights. So we've talked already about some of the ways in which you can file complaints or, or uh, places where you can get help. 
uh, but the, the organizations I'm going to go through now are unique in that they are in all states and territories, uh, so there is one near everyone, um, and they can get their assistance. So first, we have the State Councils on Developmental Disabilities, um, and those are federally funded self-governing organizations um, that are charged with identifying the most pressing needs of people with developmental disabilities um, in their particular state or territory. Uh, there are 56 councils um, across the country and territories, and they uh, have a number of uh, areas in which they work. Uh, one of those areas is to um, empower um, individuals with developmental disabilities uh, through self-advocacy and teaching self-advocacy skills and support um, self-determination. Uh, the uh, first uh, website in the uh, first uh, bullet uh, is for more uh, information uh, through the Administration on Community Living, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. The second link is to the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, and that's an organization based here in Washington, D.C., um, that represents all of those individual uh, state councils. Um, and they also, their website is also available uh, for more information. Uh, secondly, uh, there are, if we have the protection and advocacy system, and uh, they are also referred to as the P&As. They work at the state level uh, to protect um, individuals with disabilities uh, by empowering them and advocating on their behalf. Uh, there are 57 uh, PNAs in the United States and uh, territories, and they are dedicated to uh, fighting for the uh, personal and civil rights of individuals with disabilities, and they provide uh, legal support uh, to uh, individuals to help them navigate the legal system and to achieve uh, resolution and try to encourage changing of systems if they can. Uh, they also ensure that individuals with disabilities are able to access their rights uh, to make choices, contribute to society, and live independently. So the, uh, through uh, either the first or second uh, website listed on that bullet, um, you can find uh, your local uh, PNA uh, that serves your state or territory. The second link is for the National Disability Rights Network, which is uh, an organization that represents the PNAs that's based here in Washington, D.C., and there's a wealth of information on their website about how to get assistance as well. And lastly, we have the Centers uh, for Independent Living, and those are consumer-controlled, community-based um, organizations. They are in um, all states and territories um, as well, um, and they provide a, a, a array of independent living services. They help people um, with advocacy needed when they encounter barriers. They help them uh, figure out what steps they can take. Um, and the uh, first link will provide you uh, with information from the Administration on Community Living about Centers for Independent Living. And the second link is to the National Council on Independent Living. Um, and that is, again, the organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, that works with Centers for Independent Living. Uh, and there's a wealth of information about how to connect with your local uh, Center for Independent Living um, if, you, if you need further assistance. This slide is our contact information. Uh, so we have our email addresses and the issue areas uh, that we work on. Uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us directly if we can uh, be of assistance. And now I will turn it back over to Susan uh, for some uh, questions. Yeah, we've got a handful of questions um, of disparate nature, some of which can probably be answered a little more, more eas easily than others. Um, the first questioner uh, talked about uh, being, being denied access to a public accommodation about a, a year ago. They denied him access because of his service dog. He uh, complained to the manager uh, and indicates he's raised this complaint with several agencies. Uh, the Justice Department, uh, if he made a complaint to DOJ, did not appear to have uh, provided him a satisfactory response. 
and they referred him to a local agency and he wants to know is there any other recourse to hold this uh, establishment accountable um, the protection and advocacy a system in his state might be able to uh, advise on further steps he might take his uh, center for independent living might have some uh, suggestions that uh, he could follow or might might be able to uh, assist him in mediating with the bar. Um, any other suggestions, Heather or Lee? Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, the other option would be to contact a private attorney. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act does include um, the uh, opportunity to go to court to enforce your right. This would be under Title III. Um, and attorneys uh, can, can represent you and they have the opportunity to get attorney's fees from the business. So that would pay the cost of representation. Uh, so, uh, and and con consulting with your local uh, protection and advocacy uh, team in your state or territory uh, would be a good first step, as Susan said, and then that may be a second option. Okay, and then the um, second question, uh, questioner indicates he's trying to get something called soft wheels for uh, his wheelchair through his wife's insurance company and is not getting satisfaction for that. Um, uh, the Affordable Care Act required insurance companies to provide uh, what are called essential health benefits, and I'm not, sh not sure if uh, soft wheels fall under durable medical equipment, but wondered if, uh, Lee, do you have an, you work with uh, durable medical equipment and uh, CRT, rehab technology, would uh, this fall under that, to your knowledge? Um, sure. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, obviously, he has a specific request for a certain item uh, for his wheelchair. Um, you know, if depending on, and I assume it, if it's private insurance and it doesn't cover it, then it would be cash out of pocket for him to, you know, get it if it's under private private insurance. Um, you know, if this is an item, it could be possibly covered by Medicare, but he would have to be eligible for Medicare for it to be a benefit he could get that way. Okay. Um, next question uh, has to do with airlines not being able to fit manual wheelchairs in their in-cabin storage. And the questioner wants to know uh, if if there are any changes afoot um, and what can be done to uh, ensure he can, he has a quickie 7R that has to be stored under the cabin. And um, he says most planes he's been on, the, there are other things being stored in the, in the luggage bins. So uh, what can somebody do if they wanna have their manual wheelchair stored in the cabin? So this is Heather. Uh, as was mentioned, you do have the right to have your uh, wheelchair uh, stowed in the closet uh, co it, within the cabin. It, it is to be given priority. If you find that you are having difficulty with that, you can ask to speak to a complaint resolution officer. Um, these are uh, trained individuals who work for each airline uh, that are the uh, experts on the Air Carrier Access Act and airlines are required to have one of these individuals on duty um, at any time that they are uh, flying. So you can always request to ask to speak to a CRO and they will either uh, have that person uh, come to you um, and speak with you in person or they may be available by phone. Uh, but that's a good first step to take if after you make that request, uh, you find pushback from the, uh, the in-cabin personnel. Thank you, Heather. Um, next, next question has to do with hotel accessibility and uh, the challenges that 
many people with disabilities find in hotels with uh, box platform bases uh, that are now becoming very common. And this is a problem with Hoyer lifts. Uh, the questioner wants to know if he brings wooden riser blocks to raise the bed off the floor, should the hotel be required to uh, allow that as an accommodation? So um, this is Heather, we, we know that, that access to, um, to beds is becoming a, a bigger issue uh, in hotels. Uh, PDA actually met earlier this week with the ho uh, a Hotel Trade Association to discuss this very issue. Um, and many times they will make accommodations um, in removing mattresses, um, if possible, or other assistance. Um, under the ADA, they should make modifications um, if they are able to do so. Um, I would encourage a, an early conversation, if possible, with the um, hotel before arriving. Um, and you know, we know as a whole that this is uh, that this is something that, as the design of hotels is changing, um, is becoming a, a bigger complication. I don't know if Lee, if you have something else, you may want to contribute to that. I think um, you hit the nail on the head. I think um, some of the hotel brands are recognizing the fact that the new trend in hotels, uh, I guess you could say bedding and branding, is leading to these beds on box platforms and taller mattresses. But some, some brands also realize that um, they've gone a bit too far and they've been at least for the meetings we've met with, they've recognized the fact that they need to make a change. Um, even though they, I say that, change will be slow. It doesn't come overnight. So, but as Heather mentioned, for this specific incident, incident I would make that request in your reservation because you want to, when you make a reservation with a hotel over the phone uh, and you're talking to a specific hotel you know, you want the accessible room, wheelchair accessible room, uh, you know, make that request, see A, if they've got the roll-in shower, B, what type of bed it is, uh, is it a bed on a platform, or tell them that you've got a Hoyer lift and you need access to underneath the, the bed in order to use the assistive device for you to get in and out of the bed, and they should be accommodating with you from the get-go. Um, if not, then you need to seek another hotel that does. But um, it is at this point, um, you know, it's a hit or miss thing and it's on us to advocate for, um, uh, you know, this issue, you know, to come forth, you know, even more. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, the fifth question we have, uh, the questioner writes that he does archery and needed to be classified uh, to in order to use his wheelchair. I, I gather classification meaning classification as, as a person with a disability who needs to be able to use a wheelchair in competition. He got the, the classification, and now USA Archery, which sounds like the uh, US uh, Sports Competition Association, does not make people follow the rules that are in the rule books. I gather that means does not enforce competition rules in the rule books. Um, and he wants to know how he can get help because he has, he says, I always have to shoot against able-bodied people and lanes are never set by the USA archery rules. And as a result, he has lost some competition. This is rather uh, specialized, but it sounds like 
USA Archery does have some uh, reasonable accommodation policies that local competitions are supposed to follow. And I, I guess if he gets to a local competition, he needs to have those USA archery rules with him to ensure that he is able to compete according to those reasonable accommodations. Any other thoughts? Yeah, if it's if this is a systemic issue, um, this again may be something uh, worth bringing to the uh, attention of a protection and advocacy organization. Uh, certainly, there have been um, a lot of uh, issues about sports and competition and and being able to uh, compete. And if it's something that is needs to be looked at more broadly, that may be. Um, an effort. It may also be, I, I'm a little unclear as to where exactly the problem lies. Um, if it's with the uh, USA Sporting Authority, then maybe having um, a conversation with them about how they can better communicate um, the, the rules that are supposed to be taking place at events is also a way to do uh, some self-advocacy. Okay. Um, so it looks like, and then there were a couple of questions about will the slides be available, and I believe that's true. Is that right, Heather? Yes, the, the webinar is, is being recorded, will be available on pva.org and sent to registrants. Um, and we will also have a, a separate PDF uh, version of, of just the slides available. Okay. Well, that, I think, gets through all of the questions. Whoops, there's a sixth question. Uh, well, our uh, USA Archery uh, questioner is has some issues with USA Archery. Um, maybe we can, maybe our, maybe PVA Sports Department would have some uh, recommendations as to how to self-advocate in that, that we could answer later. Offline. Yeah. Okay, that's, um, those are all the questions. So that's gonna to conclude today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. Again, the webinar will be available uh, on pva.org. Uh, we will be doing a future webinars, uh, webinars again in the future, and we invite you to, to tune into those. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you. Okay.